Trying to make it through the day, pretty much. I love, I love this place. This place is absolutely gorgeous. Hey guys, it's Alex Torelli, and welcome back to another episode of the Hand of the Day. For today's episode, bringing it to you from Laguna Beach, California, my home here. I'm really excited to be back. Uh, but I got really something awesome for you guys today. Uh, in coming up in preparation for the World Series of Poker, I wanted to feature a lot more of cross collaborators, people that I talk to regularly in the poker industry, experts in the game in their own field. And today's guest is someone I'm really excited to share with you. He just got third place in the World Poker Tour at the Commerce for almost 450,000, an excellent tournament player, someone I go to to talk tournament strategy every time I go to an event and, and get prepared, get in shape to play some tournaments. His name is Alex Kadabra. Kadabra is his name online, Alex Keating. Awesome player, respect him a lot. We go way back. So gonna jump into a hand he played uh, on his way to get to that final table, that third place finish, and he's going to share all the details with you guys today. So, let's get in. So, I'm on here with Alex Keating. Thanks for taking the time and jumping on the call today. Um, congrats on the third place finish, first of all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's your biggest live score, right? That's my biggest one. Yeah, it's huge, man. It's been a long time coming. I know, uh, I know. You've, I've been watching you on the tournament scene and online, and I know it's been, uh, you know, too too late almost. I feel like you should have, you know, you had some misses that were close before. Yeah, I, uh, you did uh, well deserved anyway. Um, so congrats. So I know you got an awesome hand that you want to share with us today that kind of helped you on the road to the final table. And I know there's so many key points in a tournament. So many things have to go right. So, so many great plays you got to make, big folds you got to make uh, to get there. So why don't you walk us through this hand that, that was really pivotal for you? Yeah, so I got a good one. I wouldn't say this one was pivotal for me and my success as much as it is uh, keeping me from just going broke and just staying in the tournament. I was down to, at one point in this tournament, you know, I start with 30,000 chips. I was actually down to 7,000 chips um, from the 30,000 starting. And a lot of people, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but there's, there's kind of a tendency to kind of give up uh, at, the, at this stage and maybe, you know, kind of gamble a little bit. And if you get up to, uh, you know, 20, 30,000, you know, uh, people start taking it a little more seriously again. But it's just like, you know, as long as you have chips in a tournament, you're never out. Anyway, I started this hand with about, I don't know, 13,000 13, or so chips. I opened the, um, the hijack with Ace-9 suited. The button called, and the big blind. Flop comes down, Ace-8-3 with two hearts. I didn't have any hearts, I just had Ace-9 ace space. Okay. Uh, the big blind checks, and the action on me. I mean, I decided to bet half the pot, and after uh, after a little bit of uh, just in hindsight, I I don't think I really like this bet because it's going to be really hard to get three streets of value. What I mean by that is, uh, if I bet the flop in one of my opponent's calls, and bet the turn in one of my opponent's calls, and we get to the river, uh, assuming you know I don't improve my hand and the board runs out pretty clean, which is like you know two things that are not even easy to happen uh, to begin with, but let's say the board just runs out like a three and a deuce. That's kind of a, a pretty clean run out uh, without any hearts. Yeah. Even even when the board comes out that good for me, when I bet the river again, it's it's anyone with a hand worse than ace nine, it, it becomes it becomes a difficult call for them. Right. That's a really good point. So knowing that you can't win three times with betting by the river it gives credence to checking at least one street and so maybe the flop is a good place to pot control as well as you know disguise your hand a little bit and bluff catch sure and then uh on top of that um besides uh, just the, the bluff catching and the and uh, just basically my hand it just isn't vulnerable uh, as it would like if i if i had 10 9 and flop came 10 2 3 well this is a totally different top pair there's a lot of just, just straight over cards, you know. There's a lot of hands that, that, uh, that there's a lot of turn cards and river cards that are more vulnerable. 
my ace nine, you know, there's not if, if someone does has not paired yet and does not have a flush draw, they don't have any immediate outs to beat. Yeah, so it's a spot where you're either way ahead of their range, which they're pretty much drawing dead, or you're way behind their range, which you know yeah, you're pretty much drawing dead. Because there's there, there's a plenty of uh, flush draws that they can have. Right. Oh, but you know, basically any hand that's uh, that can call me is going to call me on this uh, on this swap. So. Like, uh, I'm never going to get hearts to fold, and I'm going to get hands that, you know, maybe I can let turn a pair uh, uh, to fold, with, which I don't which I don't necessarily want. And right. Basically, you might get more value if they pick up a pair on the turn. Yeah. Like, let's say my opponent has king-jack on a 10-2-3. Well, they have six immediate outs. If they have king-jack on an ace-8-3, uh, they have yeah, six no, immediate outs. Yeah. Uh, or they have no immediate outs. Yeah, exactly. There's the no equity. Basically, basically, if someone if someone flopped uh, poorly on the hand, it's going to be really hard for them to catch up. So there's not that much uh, vulnerability for me. Yeah, that's a great point. So we bet, but in hindsight, checking definitely has some points. When when I thought about it, I think I, I think I should have checked. Okay. I, so, the immediate thinking on the flop was I'm playing with two kind of loose players who are playing a little bit too many hands, and they're going to have some eights, and they're never going to fold them on the flop, and and that's just kind of what I wanted. Right. I, I, I still think it's better to check. Yeah. Betting can't be bad. I mean, default is to bet. So anyway, we bet half the pot, and what, what ended up happening? I bet half the pot, the button folded, and the big line called. Cool. Turn card was an ace, and, you know, I, I've got three aces with the nine kicker now. The nine kicker's beating the board. But, you know, um, so I, I bet 1,500. He, ch he check raises to 3,000, just a min raise. First of all, my immediate thinking is, even if, he, he shouldn't really even have that many ace-2, ace-3, ace-4, ace-5, ace-6, uh, ace-7, ace-8 in his range because he probably he doesn't, when, when they're off suit, he really doesn't have to call those three flops. They're really not that easy to play. He's been playing on the tighter side anyway. Yeah. So um, that leaves only the suited combos, which aren't that many. Right. But even if he had a suited weak ace, ace-2, like most people would just call down with that hand. Yeah, for sure. Not expose themselves to a check raise out of position. Yeah, well, a three bet in this case. Yeah, they've, they've already check raised. Um, so it, it's it's really more of a pocket troll type hand, despite uh, despite it being really strong. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So it, it, with the pot odds I'm getting, you know, I'm I'm really uncomfortable. Even if he has ace king or ace queen, it's still almost kind of a pocket troll type hand. Not necessarily because you're really worried about being beat at this point, but because you know not many worse hands can continue, and it's like. Even if that person was to make a mistake with an ace, they still have to have an ace first, which is, you know, there's only one of them left. Yeah, for sure. I agree. So it's almost better to trap. So it's kind of like when he raises here, it's like a bluff or a boat in a way. And, you know, you got to really question if he's even bluffing here. Right. Well, the good news is no matter what he has, I have three immediate, well, four immediate outs to the nuts. An ace is good, of course. Excuse me, quads. And three nines will, will, will make me the best hand also. Yeah. Um... I would say an eight uh, gives me effectively the nuts also. Yeah. Uh, and a three, I would only be losing to a pocket threes and ace eight. Right. Um, so for the price I was getting, I wanted to call, and you know, there's, I, mean, I kind of have like this little 5% rule. If I'm playing with someone I don't know who have never seen play poker before, I kind of have this rule that 5% of the time someone's doing something retarded. Just, just, just really, really just silly, just something you wouldn't expect. Like you call the river card comes and goes check check and they turn over a pocket ten. Yeah, exactly. Just to, yeah, totally. I see this once in a while and with the pot odds I'm getting everything else that's, that was going on at the table. I thought it was worth just the fifteen hundred and the fact that I can draw to the nuts. Also. I like that. I like all the reasoning. So we call. What happens on the river? Um, the river card is a queen of hearts. So now the now the flush draw has got there. So even if he was bluffing with, uh, if he just decided to turn hearts into a bluff, which honestly I don't really expect. He's gotten there now, so right. he bets 5000 on the river. And I chatted with him for a while, wanted to see if he was comfortable or not, but I just I just don't really think I can justify calling this because I just don't think I beat him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great fold. I mean, it's a spot where, you know, the pot's getting big and you're short-stacked in chips and mentally you can allow yourself to get frustrated and talk yourself into a hero call or a bad call, and then, you know, that's how you... That's the difference between giving yourself a chance to come back in the tournament, which of course you did and got third, or just kind of letting your tournament go to waste and you're never going to realize, you know, this outcome uh, or even know what the possibilities were. So props to you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just don't, I just don't think he's going to show up with, 
You know, it, he, would, he would have to be showing up with one of those 5% of the time that he just shows up with something absolutely wacky. Yeah. Even if he was bluffing, you know, he's, fa- he's found his way to get there. I guess he could have a hand like 4 or 5, but that would probably, even, even a 4 or 5 student would probably just hold the flop with the gut shot. It's probably not, probably wouldn't call to check min raise. It would just, it would just be have to be completely something totally wacky. In the ten thousand dollar tournament, you know, you might see a little bit of wackiness, but that would be pretty much forced three streets of wackiness. Yeah, for sure, it's unlikely. Uh, so, what do you do? I know uh, viewers are going to be curious about this. What do you do on an offsuit queen, like the queen of clubs, for example? Um, I, don't, I don't really think that that much changes. Uh, even though, like, th- this helps this helps a whole a, a lot because uh, I'd say a little because if he was on a on a draw on a bluff, he'd probably have a draw. And if he had a draw, he would probably get there. Right. But I didn't think he was bluffing that that much. I was kind of like the price I was getting was so good that that the the one of two things that I wanted to happen either I fell up to a, to a strong hand, uh, catching an ace and nine or pairing the board on the river, or he shuts down on the river. Yeah, realizing you're beat, and he just realizing he's beat and just checks. Yeah, or or, or just like maybe he just. He, you know, he seemed kind of an amateur player. He might have just, you know, wanted to find out where he was with a weak ace. Yeah, that's always, like, the biggest consideration for calling. Like, ace five, he doesn't know where he's at. He yeah. check raises, and then he checks. But he's never going to barrel that hand on the river. So when he bets, it divides his range even further between bluffs and made hands. And there's just so unlikely he's bluffing, especially after you call the turn. It's kind of the cool thing about having position. Because if I, if I call, you know, I, I can make my decision a little bit, like... It, he he has to act first. So once he decides to shut down, I can always just show just, just show down my hand. It's only costing me fifteen hundred to to, to get to final, showdown to see the final card. And you know, it, if I do have him beat, he's probably just going to let me show it down. Right. That's yeah. That's the huge thing about position. And that's a great point there. Being out of position totally changes that hand. It doesn't really allow you to get the information you need to justifiably call. So that that's a great example of a hand. I think it's it's different than what people were expecting because I feel like most people would expect some you know, big hero call or something that, that gets you back in the tournament, but sometimes it's the hands that save you, and you know, the, the empowerment you get from the mindset of still holding on and still wanting to fight for the tournament that keeps you, you know, motivated to play the rest of the time. Yeah, when I, start, when I started playing, I, I really, you know, once, once I got down to that kind of micro stack, I mean, it, it's really common to have to grind 10, 20, 30 big lines in a tournament. Sometimes you're doing that the entire tournament, but when you're talking about one one fifth, one sixth, one seventh of the actual starting stack. It kind of gets an, uh, it kind of. I mean, your your equity super plummets. I mean, if you're taking if you're taking one fifth of a starting stack, you know your odds of actually making the money jump up to like one in a hundred. Right. Like that. So it's like, so so it, it, it's frustrating in that sense, but it, it, it's actually kind of in, in, enjoyable to to be able to play that stack. I've, I've kind of gotten used to it, and, and you just never want to give up in these situations uh, because. Almost every tournament I've won, I've usually been down to under five big blinds at some point. Yeah, it's an impressive statistic. I know so many pros say that, that, you know, at some point they're all short stacked. So it's not like, you know, the, the pros just are the chip leader the whole way. I mean, it's it's very rare when that happens. And of course, it's a great thing It's when it's that easy. But most of the time, you got to work for it. All right, man, this is awesome. So uh, I know Alex, you offer coaching as well. So to get in touch with him, why don't you tell everybody your contact details? They could hit you up um, if, they're, well, if they're looking. The, the best way to contact me would be uh, on Twitter, uh, which is Heads Up Goalie. I, I check it from time to time. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's Keating Snaps. And you can always drop me a line on Facebook. It's you, easy to contact. You got it. Get in touch. All right, Alex, thanks a lot for your time. I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. Probably see you at the World Series. Yeah, you got it. Cheers, man. Take it easy. See you there. Later. The hand of the day.